I'm really happy to be giving this talk today. Um, and I do have a presentation, but it's the most minimal presentation that you can imagine. It's uh, not going to contain that much, but I'm basically going to talk and uh, the um, presentation is just just contains a few buzzwords so you know where I am uh, in the uh, in the whole thing. Um, so um, what I want to talk about today is well, when you look at conspiracy theories and fake news, then many people um, wonder how come that people believe such weird things. And so this is why the talk is called fake news and conspiracy theories. How weird are people who believe weird things? Because um, I wanna uh, question the assumption that people who believe weird things are necessarily weird in the way they um, form and update their beliefs. So, so while fake news and conspiracy theories are not the same thing, they're often mentioned in the same breath. And I guess there are many reasons for that. One reason I take it is that their content is often so very weird that one cannot help but wonder what is wrong with people to believe such weird things. And in this talk, I argue that one need not employ weird ways of thinking in order to end up believing weird things. Standard ways of belief formation and updating go a pretty long way in explaining the current prevalence of fake news and conspiracy theories. That is not to say that these standard ways of belief formation and updating are unproblematic. It's just to say that one need not postulate extraordinary belief formation and updating processes in order to account for the fact that people believe extraordinarily weird things. Um, and the, the outline of the talk is going to be this. In section one, I'll elaborate in more detail on both conspiracy theories and fake news and disentangle the two phenomena conceptually show that while distinct, they may well be co-instantiated in many cases and explain how fake news serve to bolster conspiracy theoretical views. That's one part. Then in section two, I'll turn to the main question, how weird are people who believe weird things? And here I sketch how fairly standard belief formation and updating processes can lead to radically different views in different people and indeed outlandish beliefs on a subject matter in individual people. And I conclude that people who believe weird things need not be particularly weird in the way they gather and evaluate information. And then there's section three where I formulate a number of uh, uh, takeaways that we can derive from this point, but this is gonna be very, very uh, quick and basic. Um, and I should say that, um, David, I think you're here. Um, I, uh, as Tobias already said, I worked a lot on fake news with David Lanius, and most of what I'm gonna talk about today is stuff that we have uh, pretty much developed together um, in, in our, in our uh, continued discussions <laughs> over, over these topics. Um, if there are any mistakes in there, they're all mine though. So um, people believe weird things. Uh, that's for sure. According to QAnon, for instance, a cabal of Satan worshipping cannibalistic pedophiles run a global child sex trafficking ring and plotted against US President Donald Trump while he was in office. That's pretty weird. According to the contrail theory, water condensation trails, so-called contrails from aircraft, consist of chemical or biological agents or contain a supposedly toxic, mi toxic mix of aluminium, strontium, and barium under secret government policies. Also pretty weird. Then there's the view that Elvis Presley's dad, death was fake, the view that Adolf Hitler actually survived the Second World War and fled to the Americas, to Antarctic, Antarctica or the moon. Uh, there's the view that George Soros is in control of a large, por large portion of the world's wealth and governments. And of course, there's the great replacement theory, according to which immigration, integration, low fertility rates and abortion are being, being promoted in predominantly white countries in order to turn white people into a minority or cause their extinction. So-called birthers deny the legitimacy of Obama's presidency by claiming that he was not born in the US. 
Many have found Donald Trump's theory plausible that climate change is a hoax by the Chinese in order to make US manufacturing non-competitive. And currently, of course, a number of uh, conspiracy theories have been promoted about the origin and purported motive behind the COVID virus and its spread. Some claimed that the virus was engineered, that it escaped or was stolen from a research laboratory, that it may have been a Chinese or United States bioweapon, a Jewish plot, including to force uh, mass vaccinations or sterilizations, and so forth. And of course, there's the Gates conspiracy theory, according to which Bill Gates uses the corona panic to microchip the world population. Now, that's all pretty weird. And the views, the claims that I've just uh, mentioned are all core claims of conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories are often accompanied by fake news that feed into the conspirational narrative. And for this and other reasons, fake news are often mentioned in the same breath, right? Both pollute our informational environment, both are regularly used for propagandistic purposes, both regularly tap into politically charged stereotypes and resentments, both are seen as threats to successful democratic deliberation, both seem to bear witness to epistemic flaws on their consumers' part. For how else, after all, would people end up believing such weird things? But despite these many similarities, fake news and conspiracy theories are not in fact the same thing. And it makes sense to disentangle the two concepts before moving on. A conspiracy theory is at the minimum a view which explains the occurrence of a significant social event by postulating that a group of agents conspired to bring the phenomenon about. That's basically Popper's um, definition of a conspiracy theory. On more demanding accounts which try to do justice to the clearly negative connotation of conspiracy theory, a conspiracy theory postulates a conspiracy, as Popper has it, but is moreover problematic in distinctive ways. Many think the problem is epistemic. Um, for instance, it has been argued that belief in conspiracy theories is self-insulating. That's something Napolitano claims in a forthcoming paper that conspiracy theories resemble degenerating research programs, which is something Clark argues for, or quite generally that conspiracy theorists are necessarily irrational. And others, most notably Kassam, argue that the problem is political. On Kassam's view, conspiracy theories are essentially a form of propaganda drawing on politically charged tropes. And we'll get back to the epistemic profile of conspiracy theorists in the sections to come, but now let's just note that whatever conspiracy theories are, they're not the same thing as fake news. First of all, fake news and conspiracy theories differ ontologically. A piece of fake news is a report about some typically recent event or process that is communicated through media in the broadest sense. Uh, conspiracy theories, in contrast, are not themselves medially communicated reports, however, but theories in the broadest sense of the word, that is, sets of propositions which serve to explain the occurrence of a phenomenon. They're the sort of thing that is that can be believed, asserted, and passed on in testimony. Sets of propositions are not the same thing as news reports. They may, of course, be reported via media, which is why fake news may well purport a conspiracy theory. Ontologically, however, fake news and conspiracy theories fall into two distinct categories. The second thing to note is that fake news and conspiracy theories put different constraints on their content. And most notably, fake news need not postulate a conspiracy. In 2019, fake news circulated on Facebook, according to which then President Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump's grandfather had been a pimp and tax evader. Another report stated that uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez had proposed a ban on motorcycles. And neither of these claims is true. Both were fake news, um, but neither postulates a conspiracy. 
So in contrast to conspiracy theories, there are no constraints of the sort of content that can be distributed as fake news. Basically any false or misleading report will do the job. And the third thing to note is that fake news and conspiracy theories put different constraints on the propagator's attitude towards the truth. In the case of fake news, its propagators either try to deceive their audience or they do not care about the truth at all. Uh, this latter stance towards truth is what Kassam calls epistemic insouciance. And uh, in that case, fake news is propagated as bullshit. But the same need not be true of conspiracy theories, right? They need not contain a deceptive attitude on the propagator side or a negligence of truth altogether. Um, indeed, conspiracy theories may take, ex conspiracy theorists may take an extreme interest in revealing the truth and informing the public about, wh about what they think is going on behind closed curtains. There may of course be epistemic flaws involved in the way conspiracy theories theorists form and update their beliefs. But even so, that flaw need not be a deceptive attitude or a lack of regard for the truth on the con conspiracy theorists part, right? And this point is worth dwelling on for a moment because I, th I think it's not that obvious that it's actually the case what I'm saying here. Um, my point is not that conspiracy theorists are never deceptive or never bullshitters, right? Quite obviously a conspiracy theory may be the result of a deceptive enterprise or a design to clickbait, for instance, and thus go along with a bullshit attitude. And indeed, if Kassam is right, conspiracy theories are essentially a form of propaganda. And then they can only be understood in terms of their propagandistic function in societies. But if that is true, if they're designed and distributed for propagandistic purposes, then of course someone with a deceptive or a bullshit attitude will have to be involved in designing or distributing the theory. So fake news and conspiracy theories would then turn out to be on a par with respect to this aspect. Note, however, that on Kassam's view, the direct involvement of a propagandist also doesn't seem to be necessary for a set of beliefs to qualify as a conspiracy theory. Conceptually, a group of truth searchers may well end up developing a, a conspiracy theory from scratch and end up believing firmly that it gets things about the world right. Um, what makes their view an instance of propaganda then now, I take it that Kassam's view here is that even that kind of cooked up view will involve tropes and stereotypes whose function it is to serve propagandistic purposes. I don't read him as saying that only views which have, a, which have been designed under the direct involvement of a propagandist should come out as falling into the category of conspiracy theories. Now, one may come to wonder whether the same is not also true of fake news, right? Because we can ask, may not a piece of fake news also be distributed without a deceptive attitude or an utter disregard for the truth? Isn't it possible and indeed common for people to share fake news in good faith simply because they believe in the content of the report? And I agree, but in the genesis of a fake news report, it cannot be good faith all the way down. And that's the difference, right? Otherwise, any old false news report would come out as fake news, right? If, if it could be good faith all the way down. And besides the fact that this is clearly conceptual, conceptually off track, it's also something we should avoid from a practical perspective, particularly in the context of um, juridical consequences for the distribution of fake news. Journalists are always at the risk of getting things wrong. 
And thus criminalizing or even just morally condemning errors as such would have disastrous effects on the profession. So there seems to be a difference between conspiracy theories and fake news on the level of their propagators attitude towards the truth after all. The genesis of a fake news report does, but the genesis of a conspiracy theory does not require the direct involvement of a person who is deceptive or a bullshitter. And this is the third feature that shows us that fake news and conspiracy theories are not the same thing. Yet, of course, fake news frequently bolster conspiracy theories, right? Take the conspiracy theory um, uh, about the, the Pizzagate events. Um, according to that theory, Hillary Clinton, along with a bunch of other Democratic US politicians, ran a child porn ring in the basement of a pizza joint in Washington, D.C. prior to the 2016 presidential election. And the story was the brainchild of individuals who were convinced that they had uncovered secret codes in Clinton's email correspondences that had been leaked earlier. Um, now, when Russian media outlets got wind of the story, they reported on it excessively and caused such a fuzz online that eventually a man showed up at the pizza joint with a gun to self-investigate the issue. Now, the Pizzagate incident obviously involves both a conspiracy theory and fake news, right? The whole thing started out with a conspiracy theory that was cooked up by individuals, many of whom were presumably convinced to have unearthed a crime. But it was then taken up by Russian media personnel who presumably didn't believe a single word of the story, but seemed to have ventilated it for propagandistic purposes. For all we know from empirical research on this, their reports on the matter were fake news. And it's important to note though that fake news will often not simply report on an alleged conspiracy, but play into the hands of conspirational narratives more indirectly. And to see how that works, let's look at two very successful fake news from recent years. First, uh, Bas Zumo looked at engagement rates with uh, pieces of news between March 2019 and March 2020 and found that uh, the piece of news with the highest engagement, namely 4.2 million reactions was, NASA admits that climate change occurs because of changes in Earth's solar orbit and not because of SUVs and fossil fuels. Right, that's the fake news. The fake news reports on NASA admitting to this. But of course, this fake news clearly feeds into the conspiracy theory that climate, climate change is a hoax. Uh, secondly, one of the most successful fake news in the German speaking countries in 2017 was a newspaper article stating, Merkel hopes for 12 million immigrants, my translation. And it showed an image of Merkel clapping and smiling while behind her there's this track of, of immigrants. Um, as it's easy to see, this fake news feeds into the Great Replacement Conspiracy Theory, which assumes a master plan to extinguish the white race. What these examples show, however, is that the interplay between fake news and conspiracy theories need not involve fake news that just bluntly repeat the core claim of a conspiracy theory, right? The dynamic is way more subtle and for structural reasons. Conspiracy theories typically state that some sort of overarching process is taking place, whereas fake news are, yeah, well, they're news. They will state that some event has recently occurred. So the way fake news feed into conspiracy theories will therefore be often indirect. Fake news reports will often state that some event took place that then yields support to the idea that the overarching process postulated by the conspiracy theory is also taking place. And that is to say, fake news will often generate information 
that can serve as evidence for the postulated conspiracy. If NASA admits that climate change is not man-made, then this can serve as a piece of evidence for the idea that the whole climate change narrative is a hoax. If Merkel says that she hopes for 12 million immigrants, then this can serve as a piece of evidence for the idea that we're in the middle of the great replacement. In this sense, fake news regularly feed into or bolster conspiracy theories without actually containing the conspirational claim themselves. Okay. Why do people believe such weird things? In the face of the often blatant outlandishness of conspiracy theories and fake news, one cannot help but wonder what is wrong with people. In, and in what follows, I'll argue that the answer might be, well, not that much because standard belief formation and updating processes already go a long way in explaining the sometimes outlandish directions of people's worldviews. And again, that is not to say that these belief formation and updating processes are unproblematic. It is just to say that they're fairly common. So the point I'm after in this section is that we need not postulate extraordinarily ep extraordinary epistemic processes in order to account for the fact that some people end up with extraordinary belief. Standard epistemic processes plus a few assumptions about fairly common initial credences and the distribution of trust will do to explain how individuals may end up believing radically different things about the world and indeed very weird things too. Okay. Um, initial credences and distribution of trust. Let's assume there is such a thing as an initial condition, an agent's condition prior to the workings of the belief formation and updating processes I'm going to talk about in this section. There isn't, right? I'm sure there isn't. We have been forming and updating our beliefs ever since we first set foot on the earth. But let's forget all that for a moment and zoom in at a point in time in which two individuals, call them Patty and Paul, hold fairly standard sets of beliefs about most states of, states of affairs. They believe that traditional media are mostly reliable, that science makes some sort of progress, that democratic governments are generally interested in the welfare of their citizens and so forth. They also believe that those with money have too much access to power, that pharmaceutical companies tend to prioritize economic success over public health, um, that some politicians would do pretty much anything to rise in the political ranks and so forth. They share these beliefs. That is just to say that each gives, gives each of these beliefs an above 0.5 credence, right? But let's suppose that Patty is more strongly convicted to the first three of these beliefs than Paul. And let's furthermore suppose that Paul is more strongly convicted to the latter three beliefs than Patty. Now, their shared beliefs are mirrored in a shared trust in the epistemic authorities. Patty and Paul both trust the traditional media, the government, their peers, the sciences, experts, public intellectuals, what have you. Of course, they do not trust them blindly, right? Both uh, know that people they trust may go wrong and so forth, but both rely on the epistemic authorities in general in generating their own beliefs. Again, with minor differences, Patty takes the official institutions to be more trustworthy than Paul takes them to be. Um, Paul, in contrast, regularly wonders whether official accounts of the world may not perhaps be slightly skewed by power dynamics. Okay, so that's the initial condition and distribution of trust. In comes the confirmation bias. Starting off from this initial condition, let's suppose Patty and Paul encounter a piece of new information. New information is always evaluated against the background of prior beliefs, and psychology speaks of the confirmation bias here. When encountering 
a new piece of information, we assign it more plausibility, we find it more relevant, and we remember it more easily, the better it corresponds with our prior belief set. Suppose Patty and Paul encounter the news report that certain government officials seem to have been involved in deals with the pharma lobby. Patty will find that piece of information somewhat less plausible than Paul, giving it lower credence because it corresponds less well with her prior beliefs than with his. Paul, in contrast, will find some of his expectations confirmed and assign the report high plausibility. Now, the confirmation bias is one of the most well-established and prevalent biases in human psychology, and hence it would, see, would be surprising if it were all bad, and it isn't. Uh, we always need to evaluate incoming, incoming information on some basis, and given that we start out with mostly true beliefs, evaluating new information on the basis of prior beliefs seems like a reasonable thing to do. The problem is just that we usually start out with less than an ideal belief set. And then this may bias us towards false beliefs in some areas. In such cases, the confirmation bias skews our belief sets even further away from the truth. The confirmation bias alone goes some way in explaining how the belief systems of different people may indeed spin off in rather different directions over time. That is because every new belief that is adopted on the basis of the confirmation bias will itself become part of the belief set against which new information is going to be evaluated, right? So starting out with a slight expectation of P being the case, and then integrating more and more beliefs with a bias towards P will increase the expectation of P being the case. The agent will thus become ever more susceptible to P confirming evidence as she integrates information on the basis of the confirmation bias. So as Patty and Paul go along in evaluating new information, Paul may well develop a stronger inclination to think that the government is involved in some sinister activities, for instance, while Patty's worldview may remain fairly stable. Okay, let's now look at cognitive dissonance and echo chambers. In a heterogeneous epistemic environment, the confirmation bias is usually counteracted by the force with which disconfirming information is pushed into agents' field of attention by others who take that information to be relevant and important. So when Patty says, governments are generally reliable, Paul will point her towards a number of instances of corruption and fraud. When Paul says politicians and the pharma industry seem to be in cahoots with each other, Patty will point him towards political efforts to restrain the influence of the pharma lobby. And this makes it harder for each to ignore, downplay, or forget the bits of evidence that disconfirm their prior expectations. Unfortunately, however, many people do not live in particularly heterogeneous epistemic environments. People quite generally have a tendency to self-select into social environments that reduce cognitive dissonance, which is the stress people feel when experiencing a mismatch in their psychological states. Now, having evidence for something that conflicts with existing beliefs is one typical instance of a situation that causes cognitive dissonance. And hence, people avoid this to happen and self-select into social environments in which their beliefs remain mostly unchallenged. We can call these social environments echo chambers. Note that uh, the mechanism leading up to echo chambers is not the same as the one postulated by the filter bubble theory, by the way. Um, according to the filter bubble theory, algorithm, algorithms of our digital applications shield us off from disconfirming information. And this may or may not be true. The important point is we don't need 
skewed algorithms to explain why people avoid exposition to others who think differently, right? Our own preferences suffice to account for the homogeneity of most epistemic environments. So Patty and Paul don't talk that often, more, often anymore. Um, Patty avoids being confronted with Paul's criticism of the institutions. Paul avoids having to explain himself all the time. Their epistemic environments drift apart. Paul reads blogs that Patty finds slightly dubious. Patty clings to the traditional media, which Paul thinks regularly leave out important parts of the story. Paul shares and likes the social media posts by his peers, Patty the ones by hers. Paul finds Reddit interesting. Patty finds the discussions there to be slightly off. Paul hears about the Gates conspiracy for the first time. Patty has never heard of it. Let's now look at information cascades. Echo chambers amplify the effects of the confirmation bias, right? Because in an echo chamber, prior expectations are usually confirmed. Disconfirming evidence remains blocked from sight. That's just what an echo chamber does. So once agents start updating their belief sets in echo chambers, the speed with which belief sets get skewed in one direction increases. So-called information cascades increase that speed even further. Generally, justification, as we all know, can be passed on via testimony. If someone whom we do not distrust states that P is the case, then ceteris paribus, this yields prima facie evidence for us to believe that P is indeed the case. But this reliance on testimony has downsides too. If one person has evidence for P and states that P, and two people who take this as evidence for P also state that P on that basis, then the next person encountering all three statements will have higher evidence for P than all of those before her, right? That is to say the evidence for P will increase for every new person as P gets repeated and in virtue of the sheer repetition of P. And that's what I mean when I say an information cascade is unfolding. Now, for obvious reasons, information cascades unfold most easily in homogeneous epistemic environments, right? Because someone's testimony always yields only, only prima facie evidence and can be trumped by relevant counter evidence. But relevant counter evidence will usually come about in the form of conflicting testimony by other sources, including scientists, journalists, friends, uh, indeed anyone represented in the discourse. In echo chambers, however, representation of those equipped with counter evidence is drastically limited. And thus testimony will very often remain unchallenged. In such an environment, information cascades get going very easily. Paul finds himself surrounded by people who ventilate the Gates conspiracy theory. For him, this suggests strongly that there is something going on behind closed curtains. Surely, Paul thinks, the theory is worth looking into. Patty finds herself surrounded by people who, like herself, have never heard of the Gates conspiracy theory. And generally, uh, conspirational ideas don't get a foothold in her social group. The information cascades in Patty's group push into rather different directions. An epidemiologist comes forward with a statement and then that statement gets repeated and repeated. This too increases the evidence for each new person looking into the matter. Were Patty to hear about the Gates conspiracy theory, she would assign it a very low credence. Yet, information cascades are not limited to environments in which people ventilate 
weird things. And let me be very clear here. My point is not that the evidence for the epidemiologists claim is just as weak as evidence for the Gates conspiracy theory, right? I'm not saying that. How much justification is passed on quite obviously depends on the original justification for the information that gets passed on. And when an epidemiologist passes on well-researched information, this will confer better justification onto everyone in the queue than information about Bill Gates' plan to microchip everyone that gets passed on without any or with only very weak initial evidence. What I'm emphasizing here is just that information cascades skew justification in all sorts of environments and especially in epistemically homogeneous environments. Whenever testimony accumulates unchallenged, the evidence this provides to new evaluators is stronger than it should be, no matter whether the original justification is great, uh, mediocre, or uh, terrible. Okay, let's now look at bad evidence and the role of the fake news and conspiracy theory industry. Paul, we all know now, is spiraling downward epistemically. This makes him the perfect target for the fake news and conspiracy theory industry. Some have adopted the ventilation of fake news and conspiracy theories as a business model. Clicks translate into money. Um, and so here we have people who ventilate falsities without any concern for the truth. In connection with fake news, the standard example here is a group of Macedonian teenagers who realize that they can make a lot of money by posting made up stories online and who ventilated some really very successful fake news in the advent of the 2016 presidential election in the US. Other people have ideological or political motives. In connection with conspiracy theories, we can think of the Russian media outlets who ventilated the Pizzagate conspiracy and, of course, people like Alex Jones. Whether some of these people may actually believe their own theories need not concern us here. What's important is that a whole industry constantly targets false and misleading information at people like Paul. Paul's evidence is doubly skewed then. Not only has he self-selected into an epistemic environment that is particularly susceptible to certain evidence, he and his peers are also swept with evidence that is specifically designed to mislead and deceive them. Once such content hits a susceptible echo chamber, it gets systematically amplified, right? Given the epistemic processes described earlier on, there is a good chance that an information cascade is going to unfold. So Paul hears about Bill Gates all the time now. It is rather clear to him that Gates is involved in some pretty shady deals. He wonders why the traditional media do not ever report on these things. And here, trust dynamics come into play. As Patty and Paul form and update their beliefs, their trust relations shift. Trust is dynamic, uh, as is laid out nicely in uh, Bauerman and Kurnitz forthcoming. Um, obviously, um, and that's an old story, an agent's trust in people or institutions will shape what she believes. But that's not all. Um, there are more mechanisms um, about the dy dynamics of trust that need to be highlighted. The first is that an agent's beliefs will shape whom she trusts. If she believes that P and a person or an institution negates P, our agent can go either way. She can lower her credence in P or she can lower her trust in the person or institution negating P. The more firmly she believes P, the more naturally will challenges, challenges of that belief reduce her trust in whoever challenges it. 
Secondly, an agent's current trust in a person or institution will sh shape whom else she trusts. If she trusts A and B challenges the trustworthiness of A, then she can go either way. She can lower her trust in A or in B. But the, firmly, the more firmly she trusts A, the more naturally will a challenge of A's trustworthiness reduce her trust in whoever challenges that trustworthiness. Flipping it the other way around, if an agent distrusts A and finds that person or institution B nevertheless trusts A, then she can go either way. She can increase her trust in A or decrease her trust in B. And the more firmly she just distrusts A, the more naturally will B's trust in A reduce her trust in B. These trust dynamics accompany belief formation and updating processes every step of the way. And as Bauman and Konitz rightly point out, their importance cannot overestimate it in connection with conspiracy theories. Uh, when Paul finally comes to believe that something is going on behind closed curtains and Gates is involved in some sinister deals, he will already have encountered lots of evidence not reported on by traditional media and withdrawn most of his trust from them. He will have found that many of his former friends and relatives nevertheless trust these media and will have with withdrawn his trust from them as well. He will have increased his trust in news outlets and blogs that do report on the things he takes to happen. And he will have increased his trust in those who likewise trust these outlets. Trust shapes what we believe, but what we believe shapes whom we trust as well. Now, time has passed. Patty and Paul now live in very different epistemic universes. Patty is still reading one of the big national newspapers and watching the national news on television. Paul hasn't taken notice of any of the traditional media for a very long time. Whenever he does encounter traditional reporting, he's appalled by the worldview propagated there. There can only be two explanations for the fact that media do not report on the stuff that is really going on from his point of view. Either they're incompetent and do not see what's happening or they're part of the conspiracy. Either way, they're disqualified as epistemic authorities, or at least so Paul comes to think. And now, repeat. In the story of Patty and Paul, I've introduced one belief formation or updating process after the other in a chronological sort of exposure, um, uh, exposition. In reality, of course, there's a constant interplay between these processes. So let's assume more time has passed. Patty and Paul have been running through repeated circles of belief, belief formation and updating, adjusting their trust distribution as they go along, and they've become alien to, to one another. One day, Paul finally comes to think that the Gates conspiracy theory is indeed likely true. Around that time, Patty hears about it for the first time. Against the background of her beliefs and trust distribution, the, the theory seems just insane, and she discounts it. And indeed, she cannot help but wonder what is wrong with Paul for him to believe such a weird thing. Now, in the preceding sections, I've tried to answer Patty's question. Paul, it turns out, is quite normal epistemically. At any rate, his story doesn't involve any weird belief formation and updating processes. In fact, it turns out that Patty discounts the Gates conspiracy theory on the basis of the very same belief formation and updating processes that have led Paul to believe the theory. And the upshot is Paul surely believes something weird. But if my account has been on the right, right track, then there is nothing particularly weird about Paul. Let me just outline a few takeaways uh, from this. Um, one question um, that often comes, comes up is, are conspiracy theorists irrational? And 
the answer is they're surely irrational in all the ways all of us are irrational, right? There's no doubt about that. Like all of us, they are prone to faulty belief formation and updating processes, some of which I've described in the preceding sections. And some conspiracy theorists, of course, may be irrational in more ways too. Like for instance, Napolitano thinks the mark of conspiracy theories is self-insulation. By that she means a mindset that discounts any sort of counter evidence. And when it comes to conspirational beliefs, self-insulation is always irrational on her view. Hence, conspiracy theorists are always irrational and indeed in ways in which most of us are not. And Napolitano's claim is in part a conceptual claim about the way we should use the label conspiracy theory, right? Uh, we should only use it for belief sets that are self-insulated in this way. On her view then, Paul may not entertain a conspiracy at all, a conspiracy theory at all, as long as he can still be moved by counter evidence, which uh, I haven't excluded by anything I've said about the genesis of his conspiracy theoretical thinking. But setting the conceptual point aside, it's important to note that my point in the paper doesn't contradict the idea that some conspiracy theorists hold their beliefs in a self-insulating way, or indeed in other ways that are specifically problematic. All I tried to establish in the paper or in the talk was that we should not be too quick to conclude from the weirdness of a belief set to the irrationality of the believer. Now, what does this tell us about uh, remedies for conspiracy theories? Um, the, the first thing is um, rational discourse with people who believe weird things may still be possible, right? Not all of them may be so irrational that rational discourse uh, doesn't make any sense. Um, the other thing is critical thinking may be more important than ever, right? Because if it's true that the belief formation and updating processes that we all employ can lead some people into believing such weird things, then maybe we should uh, work towards um, a situation where people are better all of us get better in belief formation and, and updating. Um, another thing is that I take it that it's become very obvious from, from, the, from Paul's downward spiraling that echo chambers are a real problem. Most of these um, belief formation and updating processes that are problematic get amplified by homogeneous epistemic environments. And so breaking up echo chambers seems to be one remedy that one could uh, go for. Um, and then of course, the fake news and conspiracy theory industry needs to be stopped. That's, that's for sure, because these people um, really provide a lot, of the, a lot of the pieces of evidence that, that uh, help people like Paul um, bolster their worldview. Okay, I'll stop here. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'm uh, excited to hear your questions and comments now.